Hello, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce our guest today, Dr. Becca Cash. Dr. Cash is a dedicated mental health professional, currently serving as the director of the Carlo Counseling Clinic in Pennsylvania, where she oversees a vital initiative providing trauma-informed mental health services to students and families in need. With a PhD in counseling and counselor education from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, Dr. Cash brings a wealth of experience from various clinical settings, including college counseling, community mental health, and private practice. Her expertise spans a wide range of specialties, including trauma, um, identity-related concerns, grief and loss, and family dynamics. Dr. Cash is deeply committed to uh, multiculturally responsive supervision and clinical practice, and her research interests include trauma-informed interventions and religious spiritual identity formation. As a licensed professional counselor in Pennsylvania and a licensed mental health counselor in North Carolina, she combines rigorous academic training with compassionate client-centered care. Outside of her clinical and academic pursuits, Dr. Cash is a proud alumni of Mississippi State University, where she earned her bachelor's degree in history and philosophy. Her personal and professional journey reflects a passionate commitment to helping clients navigate complex life changes with empathy and resilience. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Becca Cash. We look forward to her insights and expertise today. So hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining. Uh, I have here with me Dr. Cash, as I said earlier, and she's been she's going to be talking to us about the very important topic, which is loss and grief. And we're going to try to adapt that into the our region, the Middle East region, which has been going through uh, a lot of trauma, where gr grief and loss has been a daily theme in our life. Uh, so we're really lo looking forward to learning from you, Dr. Cash. We're really grateful for having you here with us in this interview. So thank you so much. Oh my gosh, it's such an honor to be here and to to be considered to to present on this really important topic. So I'm really excited to share um, what I've learned through my practice with you guys. We're we're very excited as well, and we're very grateful because we know you are a wealth of expertise in this topic and so many topics. Uh, for now, we're going to just be focusing on this one topic. So we're looking forward to dive into it. Awesome. So here is my presentation <laughs> on grief and loss, and I've organized it based off of these really wonderful questions that you guys have provided me. Um, so we'll just kind of go ahead and jump in. Um, but the first question that was asked was what led me to specialize in this in this field um, and how has my personal journey uh, shaped my approach and how I support others. So um, I in gosh, it's almost like 10 years ago now <laughs> I started my Ph.D. program for um, counseling and counselor education at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. And one of my um, uh, project, something that I had to do as a part of my program was um, an internship, a clinical placement for two semesters. Um, and I chose to do my uh, placement at the cancer center, the local cancer center. It's at a hospital in Greensboro, North Carolina, and um, specifically within their spiritual care department. Um, so the, the role here was supporting um, patients and their families as they navigated cancer treatment. So I was, I got to be there on the days when people got their diagnosis for the first time, all the way into helping folks um, grieve the loss of someone from cancer. Um, and so it's, it was a very challenging sem two semesters. <laughs> um, I was so grateful for the opportunity to walk alongside folks as they were experiencing this really challenging um, sphere. Um, and um, it was also incredibly hard <laughs> for me personally. Um, I noticed that there were a lot of themes and like powerlessness, um, really feeling a loss of what's what was normal or what was my normal before mm -hmm. this happened. Um, feelings of obviously grief of like having to change or having my body is not working the way that I'm, I'm used to it working. 
um, sometimes resentment, like why me? Why did this have to happen to me or my loved one? Mm -hmm. um, justice, shame, belonging, like just wanting to for somebody to understand their experience, but that feeling so radical almost, like how, how on earth can anyone understand what I'm going through? Um, and as I was noticing these themes in my work and in my work with clients, um, there was a parallel process at play where I was feeling it too, right? Like I was feeling helpless as a counselor, like how am I supposed to help people with this when there's no solution, right? Mm -hmm. um, or how um, I I'm grieving the loss of, of patients and clients um, who um, died while they were receiving treatment, you know, mm -hmm. or um, I feeling feelings of resentment and, and injustice, like how, why is this happening to these such good people? Mm -hmm. um, and so that experience was really powerful. Um, and I didn't walk away with a lot of concrete answers, but I walked away with a lot of questions. Um, mm -hmm. And those questions seem to keep surfacing um, in my work after that internship. So when I started in community mental health, um, it was at the right at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of grief around the shutdown of society. <laughs> um, there was grief around the losses of um, family members. Um, I think I cut someone off, I apologize. I'm sorry. No, we're, we can hear you. We're good. Okay, cool. Oh, cool. cool. Yeah. Um, and then um, also the perinatal mental health. So I was working with a lot mm -hmm. of parents who mm -hmm. were experiencing um, childbirth unlike it's ever been experienced probably in humanity where they were birthing alone um, mm -hmm. or without their community supports. Yeah. Um, and so it, it kind of became this beyond counter transference experience where I was experiencing some of these things while my clients were experiencing them, right? Especially during COVID-19 where I'm also isolated and mm -hmm. having to form a bubble, right? Um, yeah. For the protection of others while helping others feel, uh, navigate their isolation and their loneliness and their anxiety in that time. So, um, I have found that as I've continued my work, um, a lot of presenting concerns, a lot of things that people bring into therapy can be viewed through this lens of grief and loss. Mm -hmm. uh, that we grieve more than just death of a person or the loss of a relationship, but we can grieve um, unmet expectations, we can grieve um, the predictability of our lives when things change. Um, we can lose um, all kinds of things. And so um, the rest of the slides that you, get, you guys are going to see are kind of what I've learned um, by pursuing research and also just in, in personal experiences and working through this, these questions that I had myself around how to help people as they've been experiencing grief and loss. This is beautiful, and this is such a critical point because obviously you're working in a very heavy topic that laid yeah. the toll on you and the, the experience of shared humanity, how everybody goes through this process of grief and loss and how we got connected but isolated at the same time during the COVID-19, what motiv motivated you to uh, get more into the resource, to the, to the knowledge of it, to be empowered, not only to help you but to help your clients so i'm really exactly. looking forward to to hearing what's uh, what's what's hidden in the next uh couple <laughs> slides yes yes well i thought that was a really important point to bring up too because um you know the work that y'all are doing is also a parallel process right like um yeah. to to be experiencing a natural disaster to experience um, war or to experience conflict in, in, in these ways that Syria, Syria unfortunately has been experiencing in those last few years. Absolutely. Um, like that's you something know, that you're experiencing too, right? <laughs> absolutely. And it's where the depth of it, uh, I feel like it changed even how we received the COVID-19 pandemic because it was merely just a disease to us on top of everything going on. Our nervous yeah. system could not handle any more changes. So we really uh, dealt with it as something normal. We we could yeah. not keep 
from like we could not keep the social distancing maybe for the first couple of days but we really were were eager to come together as a community because we needed it so it was the transition you were talking about and the grief and loss was already a theme before even the COVID-19 when it hit it was like yep we're shutting down we we yeah. cannot handle this anymore yeah life is already so disrupted it, there's not really much more disruption that we can tolerate or handle absolutely um, great absolutely. um the second question that you guys came up with was how does the type of loss so like a sudden death or a prolonged illness or a natural disaster affect the grieving process Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is such a good question because um, I think we typically have this misconception of grief that it can only that it is only a response to death, um, and that's really not the case. Um, grief shows up in a lot of different forms and a lot of different ways in our lives and throughout our lifespan. Um, and no one type of loss is easier for people to experience. Um, it's such a personal. Um, experience that it's we can generalize some things that we know um, some definitions that we've created about different types of loss or different types of grief and we can kind of have some best practices that we've learned over time and the the process the experience of grief is so personal that I don't think we can say that you know people tend to feel fare better with a natural disaster versus um, a, a chronic illness, right? Like we, we just really can't predict how people are gonna experience grief. Um, that being said, we do have three terms that I think are kind of helpful for us to know as professionals. Um, anticipatory grief is when we grieve something um, before the loss happens. Um, mm. So if we um, are diagnosed with an illness or our loved one is, and we know that, you know, change or death or something is inevitable. Sometimes we will grieve the loss of that death or that change before it actually happens. Does that mm. make sense? Yeah. 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 And then we, then we have disenfranchised grief, which is any kind of grief experience that is not validated or recognized by our community. So that could be any kind of um, kind of related to the significance of the loss, right? Like some people will say that you're like, or, or you know, like, mm, you do, it's just a pet who died, right? Like it's not really that important or that big of a deal. Um, or, um, you know, you didn't really know that person super well, or um, well, you've never been to Syria, so why are you <laughs> grieving the loss, right? Um, so any kind of loss that is, um, just not validated or recognized by my community. That is, Dr. Cash, one of the most powerful terms that I that I heard. And me and Hala, we were in a discussion that how much we tend to have invalidated grief. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to elaborate on yeah. that, Hala. We were talking about how uh, sometimes religious in 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 uh, um, in the public term uh, allow for certain kind of grief and really. Uh, hinder some other forms of reliefs, uh, some forms of uh, grief. I don't know yeah. if you had to talk about this. Yeah, actually, I was, uh, this is very interesting because I was waiting to know the answer to this question because this is one point of discussion that we had. Um, and I was actually waiting to learn more about the types of loss. And I think it's very, very important you know, the, the points that you just said, very important to us as clinicians to keep in mind, because a lot of times we forget, I think, because we have life going on and this, like we're trying to help others. And it's very important to always remember that all types of loss, it's, it's very important, you know, like Absolutely. even like losing like a piece of paper for a child, it's like the end of the world, right? Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I'm, it, this is very important point. And um, just like Maha was talking about the community and how, you know, that they, they perceive like some of the loss as like a very important or it's okay to grief, you take yeah. your time, but other types of loss, um, like it's not that important or you need to um, have your faith, like um, get the, you know, like, think about God, think about the, um, like the faithful 
um, uh, community that you have, get support from them, so they don't give you that space and time to grief. Yes. And they, you know, more like um, suggest maybe like in the community, like how to grieve and how to think about those stuff Absolutely. and how to perceive the loss. Um, yeah, it's and it's different from one community to another, but it's really nice to you know learn about those types of of loss and grief and keep that in mind while supporting other people. Exactly. Maybe yes. that's like it's the pushing towards acceptance, like very acceptance pretty much maturely, and then the comparison of other people. Like if you look, if you lose a if you lose a car, look at other people. They're losing their children. They're losing their sons. They're yeah. losing their siblings. Then you tend to hide that grief because you're too ashamed to grieve a car while other people are losing. Exactly. Yeah. People. Yes, and I, I think we're going to get into that more because you guys have so many wonderful questions um, in the next couple slides. But this idea that like we we have biases, right? Like we have our own um, schemas or mental models of what grief is or what it should look like mm -hmm. uh, or how we should respond to loss. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, I think it's very common for humans to kind of hierarchy like create a hierarchy of losses or like this is more important or more tragic than other things um and that's not to say that there you know might not be like truth in that right like when, when human rights violations are happening like that is a different kind of injustice than when you know um i don't get this recognition that i thought that i should get right like that those are different things yeah. and we don't have to as professionals who are helping like we don't have to categorize or rank those things to be able to help our client or to be able to help the person in front of us and really we, we kind of shouldn't because it does hinder growth and hinder the the mourning process absolutely yeah, yeah. um one last term just to be aware of is this um, diagnosis of complicated grief. Um, so this is in the DSM, the Di Diagnostic Statistical Manual. Um, and it's a, a diagnosis that describes um, these debilitating grief symptoms that are happening 12 months past the loss. Um, the loss. Now, it's a kind of a imperfect diagnosis <laughs> because it is reinforcing this idea that there is a proper time frame for grief that there's a um that functioning should return to a certain level in a certain period of time um however because of how at least in the united states our our system is set up sometimes we have to use this kind of language to be able to get um mm -hmm services to folks who need them um so when you hear people talking about complicated grief this is kind of what they're talking about okay yeah and it looks so much different from one culture to other yeah. right yeah because yeah. what's acceptable for one culture might not be acceptable for other cultures where it's 40 days with um sometimes draining morning rituals for some cultures and women expected to only wear black and yeah. not show kind of smiling or any kind of joy during those periods of time right, can be just restraining as well in some culture and i really like that you highlighted you know like this idea that because if it's like in the dsm and it's like a, a a diagnosis now you know like we're looking at it as like we diagnose people if they need you know if it's complicated grief i'm thinking about just like any other mental health like is it like stopping people from continuing living their lives yeah. or it's like an, a natural, like like a, a process, like um, a natural process of like I need to go through those steps or the process, and then I continue my life. Like, and this question I keep asking myself, and and keep coming up. Like, is there a time frame? Like, if it's not, like, what if it's stopping the people from continuing living their lives for a long time? Like, do they need yeah. support? Is it okay? Is it natural way of griefing? You know, and there's a lot of questions, yeah. just like you said. Absolutely. I think you're asking such like 
wonderful questions. Um, I think, so the DSM is, is you're spot on, right? Like the diagnosis, the criteria for this diagnosis is that it's impeding their daily life, right? Like it's interfering with their ability to work, to be with friends and family, to do all of those things, right? Um, and I am not sure. I, I mean, I think that the, there's some questions that we have to wrestle with as providers um, before when we start talking about time frame, right? Like I think that a lot of times people struggle with this persistence um, in the in the depth of system in the depth of the their experience and the, the experience of grief because of trauma and because of denial um, of uh, from other people of their experience like this chronic invalidation, which we know is a form of trauma. Yeah, um, and so if we can actually be present with folks and if we can um, allow them to remember and provide opportunities to grieve with them, this is less likely to be a prolonged grief situation um, because I think grief is a very isolating experience. And so if we can use our nervous systems to heal each other, then um, I think we're less likely to have some of those meaning-making questions or long-term experiences of grief. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So much, so much sense. Very powerful sentence when you said grief is is a distancing, is isolating process that we go through, where it should, where it really should be a gathering, uh, 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 an occasion for people to get together to go through that transition collectively together. And we drifted away from those kind of rituals, from those kind of traditions, especially in Syria now. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, yeah. This is a perfect segue into our third question. <laughs> um, so how can we demonstrate empathy rather than sympathy when we're supporting individuals who are grieving and in that line of thinking, like how, what which, what should we avoid saying? Um, I have, I think, four kind of ideas around this. Um, this is such a marvelous question and I wish more people would ask it of themselves. <laughs> um, but I think the first uh, step, the first hurdle that we want to try and avoid is fixing the grief, right? We don't want to put it on ourselves to make them feel better, help them feel better, right? Mm -hmm. This is a, an experience, adjusting to this loss is an experience that a person has to navigate at their own pace, at their own time, um, with the resources that they have available to them. Yeah. And so when we give advice, before a person asks for it, or when we tell them what to do with their grief, um, such as like, have you tried doing this? Or have you tried journaling? Or what do you think about this, right? Um, we are, we're forcing them onto a timeline that isn't their own. Um, and that typically brings more challenges than, um, than is helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Because again, grief is very personal. You know, it's different from one person to another. Absolutely. And sometimes the things that worked with another client or with yes. me, like when I was grieving at one point in my life, it doesn't work with this specific person. So yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And when people ask for advice while they're grieving, absolutely go for it. And yeah. <laughs> before they're at that point, anything that you say is just going to feel invalidating and like they like they haven't been heard. You know? Yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Especially this, when it's this is very cultural tricky as well. <laughs> norm. Absolutely. It's a, it's a cultural norm. Like yeah. we as a collective community, we tend to give more advices than it, we should. Uh, mm -hmm. But this is the way we show, we are showing up for, for other uh, for people. Here. And, yeah, absolutely. And sometimes, I, I don't know if I'm wrong, but I feel like words are not very important as much as the genuine feeling behind the words. And sometimes we tend to get some some of those advices even if they don't work for us with more good intention but yes. because you know the genuine intention behind the other person but we're really trying to shift that narrative of the, just validating validating the grief validating the, the emotions and sitting with the emotions rather than just trying to brush it away or just fixing it 100 percent 
um, which is like so on board with this next sentence, right? And I think we we try to fix because we are discomfort. We are we are uncomfortable with grief, right? We ourselves, when we are looking upon someone grieving, are so moved by that experience, like by that anguish, right? Like we, those mirror neurons are firing and we are remembering our own anguish, right? Yeah. Um, and so we want people to feel better, right? We don't want them to experience pain. And so a lot of times we go to those fixing places um, as a way of trying to help. And it's so well-intentioned um, and ultimately uh, unhelpful. Um, so if we can actually be aware of our discomfort with grief um, mm -hmm. and maybe our values um, or biases that we have around grief and meaning and loss and faith and all kinds of things, then we can kind of avoid unintentionally hurting other people with our words. So some really common things that I have heard people say um, to me while I'm grieving and also to clients while they are grieving are things like everything happens for a reason. Mm -hmm. um, God mm -hmm. is teaching something. Mm. Um, at least they're not suffering anymore, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And while, like, we can hear the good intention in that, right? As yeah. someone who said those things before to other people, right? Like, I know the good intention in that. And, mm. um, man, does that hurt when you? This isn't. It doesn't. It's not fair. It doesn't feel fair to have lost this person or, or this place or this situation or, um, or if it feels like I don't know. God's hurting me right now. Like He's in, in yeah. pain. Um, some of so some of these things that are meant to be comforting really aren't. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially the sentence where they always say, "At least they're not suffering anymore." they're more comfortable we use that all the time in our region unfortunately yeah and it's it's such a painful sentence yeah i think yeah i was thinking about the same like because i think ma and i can relate when we hear those sentences because we used to hear them a lot yeah. and um if you have awareness living in a, a community in the middle east uh, especially in syria when we grew up um like you know that they care and you know that they're talking like that or they're using those sentences because they care and they want to support us or want to support you know people around them mm -hmm. at the same time a lot of times you feel like there's something else that people need at this point you know and there's yeah. something missing and that's why we always you know think about okay what are the things that more comfortable to say <laughs> you know but at least i remember like saying to a lot of kids like saying those words like i'm not ready to hear this sentence but i know they care which is great yes. you know the awareness is <laughs> the, yes. the, an important thing but yes. um, yeah and i so I, I i was like okay so what do we do instead right like if we know that that's not helpful how do we show up for people what do we say because a lot of times we uh, we feel like um we want to say something, right? Like, or we feel pressure to say something. So when people are grieving um, and when they're telling us about their emotions or their losses or their memories of the loss, mm -hmm. be in that with them. Um, and when we, when it's time, you know, we don't have to change the subject. I think sometimes we, at least in, in the culture I grew up in, you know, people are sad and talking about their loss. Well, let's talk about something happier because that's going to make them feel better, right? Yeah. Um, it's really not very helpful it's actually it comes across it, it feels dismissive right um so instead when it's time for us to respond if we could notice the strengths of the person that they lost or the situation that's changed right mm -hmm. so like they were so creative like if they're telling you about a memory of them or um you really love to laugh with them or to you really miss laughing with them um Oh, the skyline was so beautiful before um, this natural disaster happened. And it's so sad that it doesn't look the way that it used to. Mm -hmm. um, or our community was so supported and connected with each other before um, the war broke out, um, before the conflict started happening. Um, so instead of these kind of like larger generalized statements about 
morality or like the goodness or badness of a situation. We're doing something that's really specific about what's being talked about. We're, we're trying to notice the strength or the, the not only the positives, but just like the, we're acknowledging what's been lost. Does that make sense? It does make sense so much because we're specifically grieving those moments. We're specifically grieving those uh, memories of the certain person or a certain event before it happened. So really sitting with that memory it would mean so much to the grieving person. And as you were saying those sentences, I was actually having physical reactions to them because they really mean so much to us, like before the natural, um, before the earthquake, what how life used to be before the war how life used to be and we're really living in that nostalgic memory and it really brings us together when we sit together and remember how life used to be it's it's a form of griefing it's a form of sharing that grief yes. and just yes. alleviating those feelings for each other yeah i really like the idea of bringing like pointing out the strength um and, and especially like the detailed ones you know it's not like a general idea because especially in, like in communities who go through like natural disasters or like a war, yeah. like when you hear the people talking, it's really hard to get something positive because they're always yeah. talking about the negative things going around. Yes. And when you have somebody pointing out the strength of something bad happened, it's just like, it's a way of giving them some like key points for them to help them throughout the grief process without even knowing, you know, exactly. because throughout the grief process, they can go back to those strengths and use them mm -hmm. you know, as a support. Yeah, I think we, hello, what you're saying really um, is reminding me of this difference between like toxic positivity and like grief, right? And yeah. like dealing with, right? Mm -hmm. So like, we can try and comfort folks with like these general kind of platitudes. It's not, it doesn't, it doesn't really feel good. It doesn't feel real. It doesn't feel authentic a lot of times to us or to the other person. Um, but when we can be specific and when we can recognize the intricacies of what was lost or what we're mourning, I think that that provides a sense of connection and belonging like Maha was talking about. Um, mm -hmm that, and that's where healing happens, right? Like it, healing happens when we can make new meaning or bond together and in, in the yeah. process of what we've lost. Um, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> it, is, it is such an interesting topic. And now while you were talking about, about this, uh, pointing the positive or bringing back the memories. I was reminded of um, this one interview that I uh, saw saw with a grief and uh, loss expert, a clinician expert kind of. Uh, he was talking about how people get stuck on the trauma of the mm -hmm. death, like how the person died. So they get stuck on talking about how they died and how the, the atrocity of the the dying and not really and not really thinking about the whole picture where if you ask them like tell me more about your son how was he before like how how was his personality how did he interact around the house then you make the focus go from only the bad event into perceiving and we're not trying to brush the pain away no, or not yeah. taking that aspect away but really perceiving the whole picture together yeah. of the memory absolutely the absolutely we're, we're trying to uh, like um expand our awareness of the loss um because of the nature of trauma right it makes sense that we get stuck in these images or in these experiences of the of the anguish of the loss or of the tragedy of the loss mm -hmm. um and um for healing to happen it's helpful if we can also expand or think maybe a little bit more complexly about that person or about the situation or about what was lost. So that way our bodies can heal, right? Yeah, yeah. beautiful, yeah. And then the last thing I was gonna say um, to this question is, it's really important for us to maintain empathy um, to be well. Mm -hmm. um, and we can't be well if we're not caring for ourselves and also grieving. Um, I think this was something that was one of the most important lessons that I took away from that internship experience. Um, 
is that sometimes I found myself rushing a client or rushing to sympathy or rushing to fix something because I was exhausted and experiencing my own grief, right? I didn't have the bandwidth to be able to sit because I was in pain too. Um, there is a whole host of normal grief reactions um, and being able to care for myself and care for ourselves as we are doing this really emotionally exhausting and really hard work um, is just critical. And I have some ideas about how we can do that in future slides, um, but I just wanted to, to bring that up to you here. Yeah, definitely such an important point. And we're really looking forward to hearing those suggestions because compassionate fatigue and being the helper, but being the affected person at the same time, because the whole community is affected in a way or another. So putting an extra pressure on people in the helping profession because they're offering help while getting almost depleted and drained yeah. from the inside. So they really want to recharge that energy and be reconnect, be being reconnected with the cause and the goal to turn that into really a growth point. Exactly. Um, I think a lot of times when we think about grief, we go to the stages of grief, you know, the denial, bargaining, you know, like all of those yeah. things. And that is a really helpful um, tool. And mm -hmm. I really mm -hmm. like the dual process of grief too, um, because it, it describes the complicated dance or just like the nature that is grief. So we do what this um, model that which is designed by uh, Strobe and Strutt here, um, they say that we do, we have loss oriented work when we're grieving and then we have restoration oriented work when we're grieving. And we are constantly moving between the two um, as we grieve as we do the process of grieving. So we can go through um, the the pain of the memories and the pain of, um, you know, the emotional uh, um, content, right? Thinking about the grief, thinking about our loved one, missing that old life or missing the old normal. Um, and then while that happens, we also are kind of forced <laughs> at times to be restoration oriented. And sometimes mm -hmm. we choose it, but a lot of times it's like, well, life is moving forward. I still have to, you know, cook dinner tonight, or I still have to, um, this holiday is coming no matter what. So I have to experience it without this thing that I'm used to, right? Um, mm -hmm. So we're, we're kind of constantly bouncing between these two, these two tasks, these two types of tasks. I I really love this model oh, because it's really yeah. normalized. Yeah, it normalizes a, a person having some kind of joy while in the midst of yeah. grieving someone. And we tend to shame, like put on top of the grief, on top of the loss, on top of everything a person going on. We tend to put so much shame and guilt on the other person if they're continuing with their daily lives, especially with the pressure of collective community, how much it can come up together for yes. uh, making the transition easier. Sometimes the expectation might really uh, lay a toll on the grieving person because they're expecting them not to eat sometimes, not to smile if they're yeah. giggling, like the guilt of giggling laugh that would escape from a person that would make them feel. And really this model validates that, yes, with yeah. the aspects of griefing, we're still human beings. We're really gathering this energy to continue life and just to, to continue during this journey, basically. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I love it. I really love this model because I instantly was like making connections and I'm, I can relate right away, you know, like, yeah. like thinking about the like bigger community, thinking about myself, like the people I know, like it makes sense. Like you're not pressuring them to, uh, or judging them that yep. they're not going through grief at the same time. You're not pressuring them towards healing. Yes. Like you're giving them time and space to bounce like between the two and live your life and yes. And having some breaks from grieving or like or your life sometimes yes. you know, like having those breaks and going back and forth it's just it's so nice i love it i love it <laughs> it's great yeah. um i think it's just so helpful exactly what you guys are talking about um it's it's why it's helping us think more complexly about the experience of grief right it doesn't look one way for one person yeah at one day right like it can look so different day to day so trying to expand our uh, our thinking around this process i think is really important um i also wanted to bring this up because um 
we as helpers can be in different places in this model than the people that we're helping right so like i might be a more loss oriented day right i might be in a day where i'm struggling with the fairness of the situation or um you know i'm i'm feeling really you know um misunderstood or rushed by my 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 support community to get over this loss that, or this change that I'm experiencing. And my client, the person I'm helping might be in a, a restoration period, right? Or, or a phase in which they're exploring um, new traditions or exploring um, with some happiness or some relief that they don't have to experience being a caregiver anymore or X, Y, Z. Um, so I think it's helpful for us to be able to notice and normalize and validate our own experiences of grief as we are helping other people grieve. Absolutely. And Dr. Cash, this had me reflect on the more existential question yeah. of being in advocacy and just witnessing the pain of others or being involved in a social justice issue. You don't have to live in that issue all yeah. the time. You Absolutely. should have time for yourself to restore and to collect the energy and then go back with more like um, n new energy to to do the advocacy work and not live only in the in the in the morality of what's going on. hundred percent. hundred percent. Man, that's exhausting. <laughs> it's just not sustainable, right? Yeah, Absolutely. Very, very important points and very powerful and deep, you know, like, yeah, yeah. Um, I loved this question. I've, in my role as a, as the director of this clinic that, um, we've created in the, in the community setting, um, I'm working with a lot more children and adolescents. Um, I typically work with, um, like 14, 15 and older, primarily adults. And so being able to dive into working with kids is kind of this new, exciting possibilities, whole new realm of work that I'm learning about. Um, so this question about what are some effective re um, strategies for helping kids and adolescents understand their grief and how can parents manage their own grief um, when they're with their kids, I think mm -hmm. is such an important thing to be considering. Um, there's some best practices um, that you know, kind of research has kind of told us um, are great things to strive for. So if we can address the loss as soon as possible, that's going to help provide stability for the child. Right. So we're going to try and name it um, in development and direct developmentally appropriate language. Mm. So instead of saying things like this um, grandma passed away, um, we're going to say grandma died. Right. Um, or, you know, um, we're having to move because, um, you know, there are people who are being violent near us and we want to make sure that we're safe. Right um we're doing things we're, we're we're not trying to scare right we're using developmentally appropriate language but we're naming it um so that kids know what's happening and they feel um more able to under like to navigate that space and can trust you as a parent to navigate that space absolutely uh, yeah it's it's such a turning point it's really it's a perspective shifting in our community because especially when dealing with children we tend to hide everything and put layers and layers on it and kids are very sensitive to our cues and kids are very intelligent and they know and they if they don't know from us they're gonna watch the media so we really yeah. turn to uh just run around the point and not get straight to the point where it's more much more com comforting and validating to a child to know that yes my parents know what's going on and they're informing me about what's going on yet with a de developmentally appropriate language better yep. to hear it from us rather than hear it from their peers or the media yep. and yeah and uh, all the and distortions that come with that right absolutely. um absolutely i think um i think you're hitting it spot on i i can also relate to growing up in a culture where adults tend to hide things from children as a way of protecting them right it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a fear of i don't want them to hurt i don't want I, again i want to take care of them and protect them from the atrocities of the world absolutely. or the pain of the world um and a lot of times that protective space where we're trying to shield them from the bad things ultimately can do more damage than good. Um, yeah, because it's very challenging as well. 
Yeah. This is very challenging because now, like I'm thinking about that as a parent, like how can I be like so clear with my kids and telling them the truth at the same time, you know, like protecting them <laughs> or showing them like the the my strength and and what I'm going through, like my yeah. grief as well. It's just it's challenging, you know, like yeah. how to to deliver that as well. It's just. I, think I feel like I need like to find a, a way w that is po like possible for me to do it. Mm, and yeah. like, if I'm talking to somebody like in the Middle East, like to help them find a way that it's suitable for them yep. to provide that for to their kids. You totally. know, totally. Yeah. So that, this is very abstract, right? So like maybe yes. a little bit more concrete. There's no like, like one just, answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like naming the emotions, right? Like yes. helping them understand, like, oh my gosh, you're really sad right now because you miss XYZ. Or um, you're really angry because it doesn't feel fair that mm -hmm. things had to change. Absolutely. Um, you're you are longing for the way that it used to be, right? Absolutely. Um, just providing that language is a way of um addressing the loss that is direct that is definitely appropriate because we're providing them with that language like we're helping them understand their experience Absolutely. and then hopefully we're also going to be modeling healthy grieving so Absolutely. we're going to talk about our experiences out loud oh that's scary <laughs> but you know when we're sad saying gosh i'm really sad right now because i miss the way things used to be hmm or I'm really short tempered because I'm just kind of mad that things are, this is how it is right now. Absolutely. Um, and we're not pushing that on the child to fix. I think that's something we want to stay away from, right? Mm -hmm. because, you know, you, you don't, that's not, this is nothing bad. This is, there's nothing wrong with the way that I'm feeling. There's nothing wrong with you or what you did. This is just how it feels to be sad sometimes. Um, and we're going to, we're going to talk about the loss, right? We're not going to ignore it and pretend like it didn't happen. But we're going to, when we're thinking about, you know, that loss, we'll say, hey, you know what I just remembered? I remember that time we did this together with this person or in this place or this thing. Wasn't that so much fun or wasn't that su such a good memory? That um, is beautiful. Yeah. And I feel this is, yeah, this is the key point. Modeling, being vulnerable with emotions. Yeah and modeling also the strength of just bringing back that memory and showing our, our kids how we're utilizing those coping skills how we're utilizing yeah. touching into resilience so we really and such it's such a huge topic because when we started discussion discuss, discussing the main points me and hala the one uh segue into all of this we were talking about how in our society we tend only to brush the to brush the uh, uh, negative emotions or so-called yeah. negative emotions so the kids is not comfortable sitting in a in in a place of sadness or in a place of anger and angerness or in, in a place of anxiousness yeah. where it, they should learn to be in that space with a supportive adult that really understands and gets it yeah. uh, and it, with, with the presence of a supportive adult who's also joining and feeling those feelings and it's not the end of the world to have exactly. to have the experience yeah, beautiful, critical point. Hmm. And like that leads directly, Maha, into my next point about taking responsibility for our own healing. So, like, hmm. as a parent, we're also going to model. Okay, like, you know, I'm really sad right now because I remembered this thing. I think my body needs for me to go to, for a walk right now. I think that's yeah. going to help me um, help me process this or help me help me feel a little bit better, more calmer. Um, hmm. And then we're going to remind them that they're not alone, right? Like. Would you like to go for this walk with me? Like it's an invitation. It's yeah. not a not a pressure, not a you have to do this to help me feel better, um, but an opportunity to come into the belonging. Does that make sense? Beautiful. It's yeah. a great so point. Much. Yeah, I like that. The invitation to join in the process, you know, like I like it. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I put some resources here on this page. Um, so this tragedy assistance program for survivors has a really lovely PDF about specific situations that might happen that we need to talk to a child about. So mm -hmm. like if we, if someone, if a sudden loss, 
Um, what if someone dies by suicide? Um, what if a natural disaster happens or we have to um, immigrate, right? Like they have kind of these um, age appropriate ways of talking about this with kids, uh, mm -hmm. which I think was really helpful. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Uh, and then um, the Grief Foundation and Sesame Street have a lot of videos and activities and things like that to, um, that you can do with your child. Oh, How beautiful. Explain hmm. And grieve together. Um, this is a resource that's specifically for adolescents. So it, it kind of like is aimed at an adolescent reader. Um, so like what happens? I think there's like a guide that's like, how do I support my friend who's having a hard time or, um, you know, those kinds of things. So that way it's more in their language, more uh, written directly to them as opposed to um, feeling like dumbed down or like a, something like yeah. that. Does that makes sense. Mm -hmm. like that. Beautiful. Yes. Um, this blog post is incredible. Um, this is a, a mom who um, wrote about her experiences of parenting um, young children while grieving the loss of her father. Mm -hmm. um, she has just some really cool ideas about how to grieve in an emotionally healthy and appropriate way um, while also still being a parent. So like, I had to ask for help and this is how I did that. Or I had to, you know, do these things and this is what that looked like for me. Um, cool. yeah. And then I have two community oriented um, uh, resources. One is Grief Share. Now these are in the US. And, um, so I don't know how helpful that would be, <laughs> but um, these are online support groups that put, people can, can go to in their area. Um, some are online, some are in, in person. Um, to talk about their grief as they're ready with folks who have experienced grief too. Beautiful. Or um, folks who are experiencing, especially the disenfranchised grief around um, miscarriage or stillbirth or infertility, um, Postpartum Support International has a bunch of free um, groups online that folks can mm -hmm. join um, and be a part of. That is beautiful. And maybe one day we'll have similar initiatives in our countries. And thank you so much for the resources. I'm going to try to reaching out to them, see if there's any possibility to translate some of the those resources, yeah. because I know they might be very um, well received in our communities, even if we have to do some adaptation, like culturally, to really more fit the language of our yes. community. Yeah, yes. even, even learning about those groups and how they provide support helps a lot. Yeah because we can learn about the ways that they provide support and how you know like link and connect people yeah. to communities to provide like to get the support and the care that they need thank you so much yeah of course yeah it's great when we don't have to recreate the wheel when we can yeah. use the model right to like help us get started um Thanks. I loved this question. So how can community rituals aid or sometimes hinder the healing process for individuals and families as they're grieving? And then what role can professionals play in facilitating these supports? This one was a challenging one to wrestle with because um, I think on the whole, because grief is so so isolating, anytime that we have opportunity as a, as a community to help address it, um, to mourn together, especially those um, uh, transitional justice um, experiences. So like human rights violations, genocide, um, those kinds of things. And then also natural disasters mm -hmm. that really focused, that have hit the community, not just necessarily one person. Um, community intervention and community rituals can be really helpful. So that can look like a memorial, it could look like grieving circles, it could look like family gatherings with meals, it can look like protest or some kind of political action and advocacy. Um, generally, those can be really helpful ways of helping the community understand and make meaning of the loss. Absolutely. When it becomes unhelpful um, is when we, in these rituals, in these um community or opportunities we're pressuring folks to conform to our grieving process or the meaning that we are making of this system or, or this this meaning that we're making of the situation 
Um, so we wanna make sure that there's flexibility in what the opportunity that we're providing so that people can take part and take something away for them as opposed to this is this is how you should interpret what happened does that make sense Absolutely. it makes so much sense and we have so many examples on that but yeah. i love the way you put it just the imposing wearing black for for endless amount of days sometimes yeah. where people really need to get out of or they're ready to leave that grieving process going yeah. into the registration and just blocking going into the registration because of those imposed traditions and sometimes rushing into acceptance very immaturely like this is god's will so you you better accept it and you better and not even um just protesting like why why this is happening to me even saying it this way would impose so much uh, religious complexities around it so really going with the person letting the person lead us through those uh through this dual model of where they want to go and then joining together as a community and um let, letting them take the lead absolutely yeah. I, I was thinking about the module that you were talking about earlier you know how like people bounce like between you know the loss and restoration and i really like when you said there's like sometimes like we have a meaning and sometimes we force it towards mm -hmm. other people and we like to think about how, how to have more like flexibility because especially yeah. with communities going through a lot you know and like a natural disaster for example like a lot of people lost their homes you know and like sometimes like i am going through one stage i'm feeling better today but my neighbor is not there yet you know like it, it's just like or yesterday i wasn't feeling well today he's feel you know he's feeling better so like just to be aware that sometimes the what i'm getting out of my experience it's very different than where he's at and what the meaning he has or you know or she has and um it's just like to be aware like how to be flexible yes. in a community who goes through a lot you know yeah it's absolutely. very interesting and i really like this point <laughs> thank you thank you i think the role that we professionals can play is just creating opportunities and providing resources and education um and then really most importantly just listening yeah um, mm. yeah I, I, that's what we do <laughs> yeah beautiful am i going too fast is it okay that we to no question? okay it's, it's you're going perfectly fine um so in communities affected by wars or natural disasters how can individuals undergoing grief support others in their own grief process which we started to talk about back in question three yeah, yeah. Um, so it's kind of the how do we take care of ourselves slide <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. um, the thing that i i had to develop in this um internship experience at the cancer center and then again during the COVID 19 pandemic was i needed some rituals in my life to help denote okay i'm stepping into this helper role and then now i'm stepping out of this helper role mm -hmm. um, so that way i could have my own time <laughs> to be focused on myself and on my life and on the things that were important to me not just this other responsibility of helping does that make sense yeah so Yes. So some of those rituals for me was like I had a name tag that I had to put on um, whenever I was working at the hospital. So I had like a, a process at a specific place by my door. When I walked in, I would take off my name tag. I'd hold it for a minute and I would have like a, a meditative kind of prayer moment. And then I would put, hang it up for the day and then I'd go and I'd change my clothes or take a shower and change my clothes. And that was kind of a way for me to separate. This was my role then and this is my role now moving forward. Um, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Especially in our communities, because I feel like it's so mixed those roles yes. where the helper in our work and then we go out to the outer world and we're still the helpers and we're tr still trying to rescue and save and love all, which obviously we cannot do. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to rest. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of times when we're when we have embodied this helper role, it's hard to rest because <laughs> we don't feel like we can until everybody's helped. Um, and that's just not sustainable. And so being able to create some awareness or some um, acts that help me remember that I am more than this role, that I have other responsibilities that I need to attend to now, um, I think is really important. 
um, if you don't have a name tag or, you know, resources or so that you cannot take a shower, <laughs> maybe it's having a meal, maybe it's a physical movement, maybe um, it is a religious practice um, or a meditative practice, but something to kind of help move me from this role into this other role. Yeah, so I remember for me, it was like driving home because there was like one, there was one long like road that I drove on every time from work coming back home and I used to think about everything that happened today and some of them like were, were like very very stressful and after that going back home it was like I'm done you know I thought about it I give them some thoughts and now I'm ready to go back to my family it yeah. was like this road I always like when I think about it I always think about everything I thought about you know going yeah. driving on that road yeah <laughs> it was unloading yeah. yeah the unloading road kind of Love yes that. <laughs> Yeah, I think another way we can take care of ourselves um, or support our own grief um, is by developing awareness about our warning signs. Mm -hmm. Um, And by warning signs, I mean, what are the signals that I'm approaching burnout? Um, And hopefully we have developed, if we have like a scale of one to 10 and we're like 10 is burnt out, we know the difference between an eight and a three. That makes sense. So that way it's not, we're not at the point of like <laughs> a total breakdown before we we realize that we're hurting or we need to attend to ourselves. Yeah. So something for me that was on my on my list, like a three, that was a, a an opportunity for me to care for myself is when I would go home and I wouldn't turn on my music on my way home, right? When I wouldn't cl- click that on and like listen to the music, that was a signal to me. And I got home and all of a sudden I was home and I didn't been silent the whole time. That was a signal to me that I needed to go for a walk or I needed to spend time with my friends or I needed to do something to attend to my nervous system and um, and address my needs. Mm-hmm. I love that. And I love the example because mostly we think about self-awareness is like sitting down and toning to our thoughts and the hard process of knowing where I'm at. And it's not really that hard. It's just like the rituals. Are you keeping up with the rituals? Are you picking up the phone to say hi to your mom? Is yeah. if people around you are saying, are you okay all the time? Then those indicators would yeah. let you know that, okay, I need to take a pause and now just take care of myself so I can recharge and go back to, to my role. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and sometimes I think about it as um, a lot of times people around me notice that I'm not okay before I notice that I'm not okay. <laughs> <Me too. laughs> yeah, because they know that something's not, you know, it's not right. Like, are you? And they ask me, "Are you okay?" I'm like, "I'm okay." Like, why are you asking? And then yeah. like going back and thinking, "Oh, I didn't do those things that I usually do," and that's why they're noticing that something's not right. But yeah, I really like that. It's like a motivation to put a list of the signs. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we're developing awareness of our warning signs. We're attending to our needs. Um, we're also going to practice some gentleness with ourselves <laughs> um, and expect the ripples, the ripple effects, right? Um, when we have a hard day helping others, I, or I'll speak for myself, when I have a hard day helping others and I experience that sense of powerlessness at work, I know that I can expect to be grumpy when I get home <laughs> um, and that there is a chance that I could take it out of my partner or, you know, be a little more prickly in ways that I don't really love being or showing up in the world. Mm. Um, and so, uh, that is not an excuse, right? It's not, it's not, you know, like that means I now get to take out everything on my partner, <laughs> but, um, instead like just being a little bit more gentle with myself and being aware that this role, as much as I, I I work to create the boundaries between helping and being a human, <laughs> um, there's going to be some overlap, and it's okay to repair, and it's okay to um, I I don't have to be perfect, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We love uh, this point. Yes, and then when in doubt, I think going back to these three questions, one of my supervisors um, in North Carolina. When, whenever uh, we were, any of her supervisees were getting to a point where they were not doing well, she would say, just come back to these three questions. When was the last time I drank water? When was the last time I ate some food? And when was the last time I moved my body? Um, 
just taking care of the physical <laughs> the physical being um, can sometimes help us be able to ground enough to then attend to anything else that we need. A hundred percent, a hundred percent, yeah. Such yeah. a critical point. Okay, we have two more questions left. So the seventh question is, uh, what's your perspective on finding meaning as a stage in the grief process? Um, how can we avoid falling into patterns of thought distortion or long-term mental health symptoms while navigating the loss? Um, yeah, dude, this is a hard one. Um, I think the stages of grief, uh, there has been a lot of talk about or a lot of um, importance put on making meaning. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that is a really important part of the process. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that it's a stage that we reach and then we're done, right? Mm -hmm. Like I don't think it's the final stage. I think we're making meaning as we go throughout the process, which is why I have this um, lovely graph here. <laughs> um, where, as well. <laughs> it makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's really chaotic, right? It's really yeah. <laughs> overwhelming. And um, the, the meaning-making stage is not... I don't know. It's not like the final task, right? It's it's something that's built into the process. Absolutely. Um, so coming back to Warden over here, his uh, tasks of mourning or tasks of grief, um, he says that you know to grieve, um, we have to be able to accept the reality of the loss. We have to experience the pain of the loss. We have to adjust to our new environment without that with. It, with that change, whether it's a loss of a person or something else. And then we have to reinvest in our new reality. So it's very similar to the dual process model. Um, yeah. um, and I think I can see meaning making pieces on each of those stages, on each of mm. those tasks. Um, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Because it's like building on our experience, me and Hala joining the Syrian professional network and trying to do this work, we're trying to kind of participate in the healing process of our country. Does that make us uh, like we're done with the grief about our country and what happened? Done grieving for the people we lost? Never. Yeah. It's always with us. But since day one, we're trying to adjust it to this new reality and thinking what are the some way we can make a difference and yeah. always the pain it's what's motivate us to do um to do better or to do something advocate for for this cause absolutely yeah, yeah. and I, think that, I also think like making meanings can even like about the same event can change over time like at one point you have one meaning something that you found and and shape the way you think about this event and then like after a couple of years you have a different meaning from the same event you know like even like going back to syria like if you talk to people um in syria like at one point they have like even like individually and collectively there's like a lot of meanings you know mm -hmm. that you get through the lot of sentences um, um that you hear and then like after a couple of years, there's like different sentences, different, you know, the way of talking is different. Um, even about the very similar event or the same event. So yeah, yeah. I agree. It's a process. It's never ending. That's the most yeah. important. There's a there's an evolution that happens over right. time and with with new perspectives and with new information and with um regrowth like growth and all of those yes. things. Yes. Um, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I really love this quote by David Kessler, who says, you don't have to experience grief, um, but you can only avoid it if you avoid love. Um, mm -hmm. Love and grief are inextricably intertwined. Um, so mm -hmm. for that last part of that question about avoid falling into patterns of thought distortion or long-term mental health systems from symptoms from grief, I think if we can embrace this more relational model or idea of grief as um, I'm experiencing love in a, in a different way, a different, um, uh, maybe a, a pretty painful way of experiencing love, um, as opposed to there's a right and a wrong or a black and a white situation, like perspective of grief. I think that can be really helpful um, in helping us be more flexible, cognitively flexible with our thinking. 
I love that learning how to love the dead after they died. Le yeah. Learning to love Syria after the war. Learning yeah. to love our house after it's destroyed. Yeah. It's a different relationship, but yeah. it's a way of learning to construct, deconstruct, and construct a new a relationship with that with that aspect. Oh, uh, that's beautifully yes. 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 Yeah. All right. Last question. So some resources. Um, so there's the resources for working with kids teens, parents. Um, the first four are some books about different, uh, the two are kind of like different, or just about grief in general, When Things Fall Apart by Pima Chodron, and then Notes on Grief. Um, those are both uh, just, just really beautiful um, personal experiences of, uh, and um, writings about kind of wisdom about grief. They're ones that you, you probably want to move through slowly um, if you are the one who's grieving. So take your time to read a page at a time or a paragraph at a time. Uh, my grandmother's hands is talking about um, racialized trauma. Um, and so I think it can sometimes address some of those uh, ambiguous or disenfranchised losses um, that are specific to culture or specific to um, uh, human rights violations or like things that are maybe on a, a different scale than an individual loss, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Right. Um, and then the inner voice of love is by Henri Nguyen. Um, he was a Dutch priest of the Catholic tradition and wrote um, several journal entries um, that were later organized after he died by some of his friends into this book. Um, and it's this kind of like um, almost like poetry that that's talking about the different pieces and experiences of anguish to freedom and to mm -hmm. healing. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's less of a like how to self help guide, but more of a um, uh, recollection or a something something more art artistry <laughs> to connect to. Um, so joining to, more into the pain, like joining yes. into the pain when reading those pages, yeah. Mm -hmm. Love it. Um, and then I've watched these three or, or used these three with clients before. Um, so Andrew Garfield is an actor, um, and while he was um, filming um, a movie and then on the press tour, um, his mother passed away. And he talked about his grief with um, Stephen Colbert, who was an interview art person here, um, mm -hmm. a night show host. Um, and that interview is just so beautiful um, in talking about grief and love. And um, I think also can talk to um, maybe some of the pressures that men feel um, mm -hmm. in regards to grief and, and those things. Um, yeah. And then this this is a video that describes how grief can show up in our bodies. Um, and then there's a yoga for grief um, practice here that um, I've done before and I've helped let clients through and it's been really powerful. Um, Dr. Cash, I'm always so impressed with the holistic view that you like tend to approach any matter, like yeah. there's collectively, individually, so like and on a somatic level, on a cognitive level. I love all the resources that you gathered and such yeah. a huge topic when we talk about like man and grief. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Right. It's another piece of culture of identity that can shape our grieving experience, right? Of the the shoulds of that we hear about, you know, men don't cry or you know those kinds yeah. of. Things. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's all I have for you guys. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Right. Cash. I, I can't even say thank begin. You. We want to say thank you. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. We can't even begin to thank you enough because those wealth of information, we can't wait to tra start translating them and channel them into into our region. I know they're going to be like a shifting perspective on the way we approach grief and loss, uh, especially with children and the, the less identified uh, identified uh, forms of grief and loss. So it's been very enlightening 
for me and I know it's going to be enlightening for so many clinicians and uh, people in the helping professions in, in our region. Well, I'm so grateful for the opportunity and it was just a lovely conversation with you guys today. So thank you so much for for letting me talk about grief and loss. <laughs> thank you so much for being here and thank you so much for sharing from your experience. It means a lot to us. And um, I personally learned a lot from the slides and from the discussing the topic. Um, and hopefully we can, you know, transfer some yes. of the skills, <laughs> yeah, and use them in a, in our daily lives. It's yeah, some of them. It's it's just like it. They're great. Uh, all of the points that we talked about, it's it makes a lot of sense. And I, but literally, I can connect and I can make the, you know, like um, meanings out of those uh, slides. Yeah. Thank you so much, and I'm very grateful and very nice. It's very nice to meet you. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Um, I'll send you guys the slides and feel thank free you. to use them however you like. And my contact information is on the last one. So if anyone has any questions or wants to reach out, I'd be happy to chat with them. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Kash. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you. Too. Thanks. Bye. Bye.